I think it will automatically record it. <gasps> okay, so here we are, the three of us, waiting for more people to show up. Paul's not coming. Right. He said, is this, a, this seems to be like always almost. There's that town something or other committee yeah, that meets think, at the same time. Right. So. Yeah, I think we, I know, I think, well, we had been another week and it conflicted with like finance committee. So then I think it's just really hard to have an evening. At, at some point we talked to him about maybe we should change the time if it's always a conflict. And he'd said, oh, I got that sorted out, but right. I don't know, whatever. And no one's here yet. That's interesting. Yeah, that's odd. They'll be here. They always pop in at the last minute. Yeah, I mean, there's really no, you know, you can be early, but it's not that hard just to show up a minute before and then be ready. There's a couple people. Hi, oh, yeah. George. George doesn't want to come in anyway, but. Oh, and Allegra. And Allegra's there. So here's Allegra. Hello. Hello. Hi there. I have to change my screen so I see people. There we go. <laughs> Someday I'll get the hang of Zoom. <laughs> Probably about the time we have to stop using it. That's, right. that's how things usually work for me. Exactly. <laughs> well, the only person we know won't be here of our members is Paul. So. We have our note taker. Thank you, George. <clears throat> Ashley is here. Yay, Ashley. Welcome. So let's see, one, two, three, four. Hello. Howdy. Hello. We need one more to make a quorum. So am I correct in thinking that if the legislature does not extend the, uh, what is it, exception to open meeting law that as of August, no, April, we will have to meet in person? Is yeah. that correct? Okay. Correct. Um, so that's our next meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there. Um, I thought there was actually something that the Senate was voting on today. They test, um, there was an extension tacked on to the budget, and I think the House voted for it last week, and it went to the Senate. I thought they were supposed to vote on it today. Okay. But um, I haven't seen any updates. Okay. Did it was it proposing to extend it or proposing to get rid of it? So yeah, right. so what it was doing it was a um. It was proposing to extend it for a year or two years, I forget. So I guess for some boards, certain boards, it was going to be two and for others, it was going to be one. I think the hope was that by the time it came around next time for expiration, there'd be proposals to actually change the state law. So right now, mm -hmm. this is just another governor's, you know, order. Wow. We saw an extension of whatever is in place. And then um, there has to be some formal, formal action taken to change mass general law. Rob is in the other room now. Yeah. Great. We have five people. I mean, five members. And welcome to everyone else who is here. We absolutely appreciate you attending. Risha is here. Hi, Rob. Hi. Arisha. <clears throat> Hello. Should we give it a minute and then start? Yeah, it's only 7.02 in my clock. S Sid is missing, right? He is.
<clears throat> uh, maybe we should just go ahead and start and he'll show up when he shows up. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, March 9th, uh, 2023. This is the Amherst Municipal Affordable Trust meeting. Um, and so I welcome all of you, uh, especially the attendees and all of our trust members for joining us tonight. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, the review of the minutes and any discussion of corrections or omissions. And again, I wanna just thank George uh, Ryan for taking the minutes and also taking the minutes this evening. Any omissions, any corrections? Any additions? Not hearing any and not seeing any hands up. I We have accepted the minutes uh, from our prior meetings. So we're all set with that. Thank you very much, everybody. All right. Um, and just so everyone knows, we are being recorded. So it helps um, for George to be able to then uh, be accurate in, in uh, transcribing the minutes. So. Um, so the next one, the next item on the agenda is the listening session. Um, so we sent out the draft proposal. Uh, Allegra and I had a meeting together and um, we then shared it um, with our other, let me just, uh, sorry, I have to switch over, um, with the other group members who are interested in participating. So Allegra is um, wearing two hats from the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. And we have uh, Philip Avelia and Liz Haywood from the Human Rights Commission, Nancy Gilbert uh, from the Health Department. Uh, Philip um, heard from her that she was very interested and reached out and she agreed. Uh, and then from the Amherst uh, Municipal Affordable Trust, Allegra and myself. Uh, we are actually gonna have a meeting uh, on Wednesday, March 22nd from 9.30 to 10.30 to literally plan out uh, what we're proposing are two events. The first event being the listening session to really uh, provide an opportunity to hear from Amherst residents um, what it is that they're, um, what their concerns are, what their feedback is, where they think we all should be heading. Um, it's a real opportunity just to be available to them and hear from them. Um, and then uh, the second event, we really want to uh, try to address some where we can in trying to connect people with resources that do exist. Um, I think there was a, a, a proposal in terms of the listening session as well as to have a, a couple of um, organizations uh, maybe speak about some resources, but I think the first part of it really should be an opportunity for residents to speak their mind and to really feel that um, all of our uh, entity, all of the group members that are there are hearing uh, what their needs are and then working and planning towards at least finding the resources or some resources, but really connecting to them to the resources that are available. So what we're thinking about is evenings uh, from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Um, we're not yet clear virtual versus in person, but um, you know, in terms of their resources, it, it might be best to be in person. Um, and, you know, there's a suggestion that possibly both should be in person. Um, but our experience has been that if you have at least the virtual listening session, you might have more people feeling um, that this is accessible to them. Um, so we're thinking April uh, and then having three weeks in between so we can um, then gather uh, who could speak to the different resources that might come up as needs from the listening session. Um, we want to be cognizant that we don't do it when there is a school vacation or any other event that's happening. So we'll check to make sure that there are no other major events. We don't want to compete with anybody else. Um, we're going to look at a central location um, in town, uh, around town, uh, that's accessible. Um, if we do it in person, that also has parking, because um, that's we, we know that's also a challenge. And, um, you know, we're looking at other organizations that we want to invite. So we have a whole list, but we'll absolutely take feedback. Um, you know, we're looking at marketing, um, because we really want to make sure that this information gets distributed far and wide. Um, I think one question is, um, I'm sure there's going to be costs related to doing this, um, translators, interpreters, uh, flyers, possibly space. Um, and so that is a question that uh, this group's going to have to make a decision about, um, meaning the group that's planning this. But um, I might bring back to the trust um, if we need to contribute to the event. So I want to open it up to see if there's Anything else? First, I'll open up to Allegra, uh, who's my co-convener. Um, 
conspirator in, in working on this event um, and then open up to the rest of the trust members to see if you have any feedback or uh, any suggestions. Well, I think you did a really good job covering all the points and doing it concisely. <laughs> So trust members, comments, feedback, suggestions. Yes. Ashley has an actual hand. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't find the thing. But um, for one thing, I wonder if we could do it at the Amherst Survival Center. That has, um, of course, we'd have to ask them. But I don't think they're open at night, except for sometimes on like a third, well, sometimes on a Thursday. So I guess it depends when, but then also it's a big meeting hall and they, you know, they're very friendly and they tend to do things for free, but we could see, and also they have a kitchen. Um, but then also I was just, just um, in general, I mean, you said residents, but I mean, what I've been doing is talking to people that work in Amherst, but they can't live in Amherst because they can't afford it. So let's, I mean, residents might cover it just as the word, but let's say people that live here, people that want to live here, people that work here, stakeholders in some way, like it's a little bigger than residents because there's a lot of people priced out of Amherst and I, I do want to invite them. Thank you. That That's excellent. Yes. Uh, so in our, in our, distributing information, people who live here, people who want to live here, and people who work here, and maybe go to school here as well. Yeah, totally. So one thing would be, it, I guess, the expectation of if, if this is going to be like a live event, so someone could watch through Amherst Media or online, then it has to be in a location or somewhere where we have cameras, and that gets a little tricky. Um, there's not too many spaces that have that. Um, or, you know, because it'd have to be a hybrid meeting or something. And then the other one is, I think there's still the COVID um, capacities in meeting rooms. So, you know, they, those, the, the overall capacity of rooms was reduced. And I think those are still in effect. So the town room, I, maybe it's just for town government buildings, but I know we still have reduced capacity in certain rooms. Um, I'm not sure you know, if that apply, where, how, how that applies, but I just, you know, I'd want to look into that if it was going to be in person, just so that we're not having a meeting room where, you know, we can only have 50 people and hundred show up and then they have to go somewhere else. Um, and just to say that I'm also on the board of the survival center. Um, I think the, I, I would guess that that space is too small, um, but it would really depend on what, you know, please feel free to come back to me if that, if you want me to explore that. Thank you. And, and just, my only other comment is I'm really excited to do this. And I really hope we can find a time that all of us, uh, or at least me can actually go. <laughs> so what is too small? Just how many are we expecting? What is, what's ideal? I mean, even if the three boards and committees are there, you know, that could be 20 to 30 people. And then if we get 30 people in the audience, I mean, that's just, that's 50. So, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing we'd have, you know, closer to 70 people, depending on how well it's advertised. So, I, I mean, it, I think that this is an important topic and people are interested in it. So that, that's, it's always hard to say, right? But when we've done previous forums and we have a lot of broadcasting of it, it you know, I'd say it's probably like 40 people is a pretty standard amount. Um, there is, uh, go ahead, Carol. I just wanted to say, I, I will totally go with what the group of you comes up with, but for some of the reasons that Nate just said, and for some of the reasons of people's access, I would kind of like it to be virtual. It makes much less it much less difficult than if there's really a lot of people. It gives more gives people a real chance to more people can be have a chance to be there. That's just my my two cents. And like I said, I'm totally happy to go with whatever you guys come up with. Okay, um, there is a hand up in terms of our attendees. 
Nate, can can yeah. we allow them to speak? Go ahead, Eliza. Hi. Um, officially, I'm observing for the League of Women Voters. And it's not clear to me whether you would like the League to either publicize or participate. But I can say that the monthly e-newsletter that goes out from the League, the deadline is this coming Monday. So that's not going to work. But it would probably be possible to have an email sent out to members about this if you decide and you don't have, to, you know, you probably can't decide now, but if you decide you want the league involved, it needs some lead up time. And I'm happy to pass the information along, but as most of you know, I can't actually usually attend meetings. Tonight's an exception, um, but that doesn't mean I'm not interested. So anyway, that's my comment. Thank you very much. Our group is going to meet uh, on Wednesday, the 22nd. Um, and I think, you know, I'll put up to the group. Actually, I can send them an email and, and put it up to the group. We certainly would love to have um, any uh, collaboration in, in making sure that the information goes out to as many people as possible uh, who live, work here, or go to school here or recreate here, um, and who really are interested in wanting to create a community here. Okay. There's, Any, another, there's another hand if you wanna take it. Yep, yep. John, go ahead. Uh, okay, I just uh, a note about what I've done in the past. Um, one is if you're looking for a venue um, that is convenient and that can uh, certainly probably be, probably be remote or, uh, or I should say mixed. Um, we had success using uh, the Crocker Farm Elementary School once. So that would be something to think about. It's also fairly convenient to get there. Um, whereas the uh the survival center is not as easy for people to get to particularly in the evening so that's one thought the other thing having to do with publicizing is in the past we have asked the league of women voters as well as other organizations to be co-sponsors and to send it out to their members so if you look at the uh programs for past forums there have generally been 20 plus sponsors that have been included. And that's a way of broadening the audience base. So I would definitely recommend doing that as well. Thank you, John. So we're already at March 9th and our first meeting is the 22nd. Um, so the question to the group once we because we went from a proposal to a planning group. Once we get the planning group together, we also may have to think about what would be enough lead time to make sure this is a success and it's accessible to people. Um, and you know, April is just around the corner, so that's also a consideration for the group. If May might be a better time, I already think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because we want as many people to have access to this as possible. Um, I think, you know, listening sessions are so important um, and to provide an opportunity. And if people already have things planned and, you know, they can't move it around, they're not going to feel like they're valued or heard. So, all right. Any other wonderful, these have been wonderful comments, great feedback. Want to make sure we get everybody's input. Yeah, I mean the first or the like the week of May seventh or May fourteenth might be good. Um, just you know, later in the month it's Memorial Day, and then okay. Well, the group will review it, and it will give us an opportunity to reach out to possible co-sponsors. Um, I would agree with John. The more co-sponsors we have, I think the more of their membership uh, would probably be interested in participating and feel that you know, this is an avenue and, and something important for them to be included in. 
All right. Well, I think I think I'm not seeing any other hands, so I am going to pass it on to Carol. Thank you. Who is probably going to pass it on to Nate? Really, who has given oh, sorry, us sorry, a? Just, I'm going to just quick question about the listening sessions. You know, I guess yeah. if it's not being a hybrid, if it's not a hybrid or recorded, I guess the question would be, how are we recording people's comments? Because you know, trying to transcribe as they're speaking is a lot. Uh, that's why you know Zoom is nice because we do get a recording, video and audio. You know, if it say it's at the schools or some, you know, the UU has been a great place too. Um, they've been really, you know, gracious in the past and use their um, room there. But you know, we'd have to. I, you know, we have a voice recorder, but I would, would just want to make sure we're figuring out how we're capturing what people are saying because uh, it, it is, you know, that can be that's a big part of it, right? I don't want to try to, you know, to try to figure out how we're going to do that. Good point. We'll bring it to the planning group. And I just have a quick question, Nate. Um, so if anybody else from the trust would want to participate in the planning group, that would, you know, make it three or more right now, it's just Allegra and myself. Um, would we then have to post the meeting? I say no. I say it's an ad hoc, you know, group that's really trying to work on scheduling, administrative, not other things. Thank you. Even though it's creating a program and everything, I, I don't know, whatever, but I'm surprised. That's all. I'm surprised. <clears throat> yeah, let's not ask too much. No, I think the, um, no, to me, this is really an administrative task, right? We're scheduling and other things. It's not, we're not discussing trust business. We're not, you know, discussing a project or, you know, anything like say was on the agenda tonight. It's really about setting up a, an event. Okay. I, I, I'm definitely interested in um, helping plan it. And I, I do think it's really important that we meet in person eventually. Like, even if we had to have two meetings, something was in person someday. Cause we've, I, so far I've only been on Zoom. And that means we, we, we don't meet each other. I mean, I don't know everybody and it's really hard to even just get to know people if you're just always on Zoom. Yeah. The listening session, I. Uh, I think we'll probably, you know, if we don't do two in person, then, you know, I think one would be the listening session would be in person. I mean, a listening session would be uh, virtual and then the resource uh, forum would probably be in person. But again, the planning group's gonna make the decision. And we have somebody from the board of health. So I'm sure there's going to be an opinion regarding what's probably the best for everyone in this point of time. But uh, Ashley, I'll include you in the emails. Okay. Uh, so then are we, does anybody have any other things about the listening session <clears throat> or sessions? <clears throat> Maybe it should be plural. Um, <clears throat> then we'll try again to see if Nate maybe can put up on the screen the finance report that he provided us and talk us through it a little bit. Tell us what we've got, what's going on. Sure, how, how visible is that for people? Should I zoom in or is that, you know? For me, you could zoom in <laughs> some if you can. I've got it in front of me too, so it's okay. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's an odd, you know, it's just a, that's that zoomed in a little bit more. I don't know how, how legible that is. Um, there's a little bit more. The, um, yeah, so, I mean, I guess the, 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 the upshot is the trust has a balance of about 700,000. Um, so it's a fair amount of funding. Well, it sounds like it, right? <laughs> but, you know, I know Valley CDC would like to request some funding for their ball lane project. Uh, Wayfinders may also for their two sites. And so the, the balance doesn't last very long. You know, I've broken it down. There's a number of different account lines. We have unrestricted funding that's non-CPA funding. So CPA, Community Preservation Act funding comes with requirements in terms of income limits that need, need to apply and the purpose of it. Non-CPA, as it, as, it, as it is called, you know, there's no, it's, you know, say gifts, donations or other things. So there's no 
limitations on how those funds can be used. And there's a balance of 33,616. Uh, the trust did allocate funding for uh, a while ago for Belchertown Road. And so we, there's some slight maintenance fees that we pay out of that account. Uh, otherwise, it just, it, there's really not, you know, we, that's um, an account that we don't draw on very much, uh, you know, in part because it's nice to have it when we need it. Like I said, it's because it's non-CPA. Um, there's the- Nate, can I, can I ask why that, which is being maintenance for the Belchertown Road properties, which are part of a project, why that can't come out of CPA funds? Yeah, CPA for housing is really to, um, well, it can support housing and it can create preserve housing. And there's some nuance there, but the town's accounting department feels that supporting the property or you know carrying the property with certain maintenance or other costs before the project is really not, does not meet the CPA requirements. And so, okay. you know, I, I, you know, would other communities use CPA funding for this? Uh, absolutely, right? I think that you could roll this into say just general project soft costs. Uh, but I think, you know, sometimes our, we're playing it a little conservative here just to be sure we're, you know, we're not, no one can really question it. Um, you know, okay. yeah, it's just one of those things, uh, how people, how we and how different communities interpret CPA. Yeah, it's just that we have so much more money that's all CPA restricted that it would be nice to not have to use that if we didn't have to, but I'm not a town accountant. Yeah. So for instance, well, we'll jump down when you get down there, we'll, I can talk about it, but the CPA, there's interest, uh, you know, we, these are invested in funds and so they're interest bearing accounts. And so there's a balance there. Um, um, my understanding is that it could be drawn on. It, it usually isn't, it's, it's a, it's a, the balance fluctuates based on the investment earnings. And so, you know, at this point it's, it's doing all right. Um, technical services. So the trust has over the few years asked for both funding for technical services, say for engineers, surveyors, wetlands assessments. And that's, uh, we try to use money, you know, from this account for that, those purposes. So the trust had voted money to look at if we could move one of the homes from Belchertown Road to Old Farm Road. And so, you know, the, what is encumbered there are contracts for some of those assessments. And those, those assessments are done. So we can probably liquidate those, that encumbrance, but, you know, essentially what was spent out of that was just payments for, um, for a wetland assessment on Old Farm Road. Uh, although it's a negative change from September to now, the 30,000 was just switched between technical services to consulting services, because that's really where it should have been. And so the, the difference really is about $2,300. Consulting what? services, again, is for contracts. We have been using that to pay the trust consultant, so Rita. Uh, so it was, it could be used for architects, engineers, or others, um, or we can keep it so that it's for direct services to the trust. And so that, that consulting service would be, for instance, the funding that could be used to pay for the part-time housing coordinator, or the housing coordinator position with the town. And then development funds, you know, we've been trying to capitalize the trust with just general um, request to CPA. So a housing trust is one of a few places that can bankroll CPA funding. We don't have to have it for a specific project. It can just be for general uh, affordable housing. Typically when you request CPA funds, it has to be project-based but the trust can just make general, you know, a, you know, just a request of funding. And so that's what we've done over the years and have been successful uh, getting, you know, 250,000 a year. So we put in a request for 400, 500,000 and we, you know, we get anywhere from 150 to 250,000, you know, whatever it may be. And the balance has gone up um, because uh, last year's CPA vote of 200 or 250,000 was moved over from the town account accounts to the trust accounts in, in the last few months. Uh, the 77,000 difference is we had been, um, there was an encumbrance last time of that amount because we had been carrying the contracts for 
the rental emergency and a few other programs that were old and we just hadn't liquidated those contracts yet. We hadn't, you know, just closed them out. And so that funding, you know, is now available. And then Valley had requested funding for Northampton Road. So that payment was made in the last, few, you know, two months. So uh, then so it seems, then I don't know, it seems like it'd be more than $77,000 more if we got 250 and spent 100. What happened to the other 75? No, yeah, you know what? So I had already included that in the balance of 466 as of 930 because I look, I, when I included um, in September, I included all the money that was available, whether or not it was in a trust account. So I, I also included the CPA funding that hadn't yet been allocated into the trust funds. So realistically, if we had said what's only in trust funds as of 930, we should, you know, we would have removed not 250,000 from the 466, right? So it was, it was voted. So what happens okay, is it's voted at town by council, they sit in CPA accounts and then the town has to manually move them into the trust fund account. And so when the funding was voted for whatever fiscal year, say it's 23 or 22, the money didn't get moved right away. It was moved, you know, instead of getting moved in July, August, September, it was moved say in October, right? So we close our books usually in September. And so then that's when the money was moved. And so that, you know, I had already incorporated it. I guess it's still, I still don't get it, but we don't have to spend time yeah. on it here. But I mean, if, if the 250 is already in the, in the 466, then I don't see how we got up to 544 by spending a hundred thousand dollars. I, it's just doesn't, it doesn't add up to me and it not maybe a big deal, but at some point I want to understand this. I'm sorry if I'm the only one who does, but I don't, I don't get it. It just, I also, since I'm on, since I'm going to ask my one other question, which is how, how we can have an encumbrance of $9,000 if we only have a balance of five on technical services. So the encumbrance is uh, not included in the balance. The balance is what's available. So in the account, there's actually the five plus the nine, but nine of it is, can't be used for anything else. Right, it's in contracts. So the balance is okay. the balance. So this balance, that $701,000 is really seven hundred and. Ten thousand dollars, if you include the encumbrances. Right. Right. Okay. That's not, okay. That, that's good. Yeah, but that's not available balance, right? So we I can't... know. I I got it. I'm just trying to. Uh, that okay. That's not available, but it but it does exist, and it is for something that we're presumably going to use it for. Okay. Well, so I have a question because, I mean, now let let's say we have seven hundred thousand dollars, give or take. Um. Is it possible that now we can start buying some land? I have found some land that's like 160,000 or so. And so I don't know what a good price for land is, but it seems like if we have all that money, maybe it would be a, a good time to get some acres to just have that we would eventually figure out what we wanna do with it. Um. <laughs> I think that the trust can, the trust, you know, has the, has the ability to purchase or lease property and a number of other things, you know, I, knowing that Valley would like to make a request of the trust and maybe another one, um, we just have to be aware of that. I do think that to look at land, if there's something, um, you know, the trust can't just buy land as a private, like a private citizen, it's a little more involved. And so, not that the trust can't, but I think if there's properties or there's some interest, you know, we can work with staff. And then it, those are things that would have to be held, say, in executive session with the trust. And then we'd have to work, um, you know, we'd want to assess the property, right? So although there might be some acres for sale, if it's all wetland and it's not buildable, it's really not worth the effort. And so some of it would be before a property is purchased, you know, we would want to get out there and do some due diligence. We have to negotiate a purchase and sale and a number of things. I mean, I, you know, we can also, the trust can also borrow, you know, right? we could go to a bank and borrow and take out um, a loan. Um, but I think we, you know, it's not a bad idea. I would just want to make sure we're not, you know, we are very, you know, judicious with how that would proceed if we were to buy property. Yeah, I guess, I guess I would add that we would want to, I would be more inclined to go say to one of the developers that we're friendly with, 
hey, look at this piece of land. Do you think you can do something with it? We would like to help you do it. And then we would have some amount of expertise going into figuring out whether it's a kind of a piece of land that we might be able to do anything with. Because I, I don't I don't have that. I don't think we collectively have that. I may be missed. If, if I'm dissing somebody here, I apologize, but I'm not aware of us having that kind of 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 uh, expertise here. Well, that's so I mean, isn't that the due diligence? But then also, I mean, part of it is that we need to I, I want to look at new developers because I don't want to rely on the older developers all the time that have there. I mean, for one thing, they're doing a lot of things. They have a lot of developments. I think we need to get new developers, but then also I think that just assessing what land is, isn't that something that Amherst can kind of do in-house? Uh, not, I mean, yes and no, but not to the extent of before you buy a property. So you might, you need to do an environmental assessment and actually hire you know, uh, different types of engineers or scientists. So it's not something that staff would have the time and some, even if we have, we may have the expertise, but we may not have the time. And so, you know, I, Carol's approach is nice because a private developer can interact more quickly with a private buyer than the town or the housing trust. And so, you know, they can keep things private. They could enter into agreements with a buyer or a seller. And the trust could always support that through funding whether it's after the fact or at some point. And so the trust, you know, for, for instance, when the town acquired the Belchertown Road properties, it's something that, uh, you know, era the VFW has to happen um, if it's through the trust, always at, you know, at public meetings, so it has to be executive session. And then we have to be very careful about keeping it uh, private, you know, not say known to the public because Typically, the town, including the trust, can't buy a property at more than the appraised value. And so most of the time, an Amherst property is sold at higher than the appraised value, right? I mean, people will bid and bid at a, on a property if they think it's valuable. And so where the town doesn't have that ability to, you know, bid higher than what the value is, what, than what, you know, someone, uh, an appraiser will, will say it is. And so, um, you know, it's different than we can't get in a bidding war with people. So, you know, five flat acres come up for sale and people think they can get a lot of units on that. Once it's already on the market, most of the time the town is not in a good position because, you know, people can just keep, you know. So let's, I, we have a hand, a hand, so I'd like to see what John wants to say. All right, John, you can unmute yourself. I just had a general question about the presentation Nate's given us, mm -hmm. um, and that is, are there any CPA funds there that would be uh, in danger of CPA withdrawing them if we don't come up with uh, a plan for spending? So I would argue no, because the trust is named in statute as one of two, two organizations that can actually, like I said, sit on CPA funding without having specific projects. So. You know, I think the CPA committee asked annually for an update on the status of about, you know, of funding. And I think we could justify why we still need those funds every year. Right. So I, I think they can ask, but there's really not a mechanism for them to pull them back. Whereas say, for instance, you know, another entity applies for CPA funding, say to fix a house or do, you know, do something and then they sit on it for five years, the CPA committee could say, you know, that really wasn't a, a product that was ready for CPA funding, but the trust isn't really, you know. Is that, Nate, is that equally true of consulting money from CPA and tech services money from CPA as it is for the development funds? Yeah, I mean, I think that they could say, well, geez, you know, how long do you need technical services out there? And and I'll give you an example of why it's nice to have that money. The, we used to carry that. We used to try to carry some funding for uh, historic preservation projects. And we it was just returned last year. And an owner just um, went through the demolition process on a, on a house in North Amherst to demolish, you know, a 200 year old house. That's uh, a very nice, you know, property. And the commission issued a delay on it. And so now we're saying, you know, how do we hire an architect to help assess the, you know, to help assess the property for the owner because there's absolutely no funding available for technical services. And so for me, you know, th that money, 
you know, $10,000 could be spent on one, you know, one project, you know, a big property needs some wetlands or environmental. So I would say having those, you know, Dave and I like to say that that $10,000 or that consulting money is helps, you know, with a project exponentially. So those $10,000, the impact is something that it could result in, you know, 50 units or, you know, the, the infusion of a lot more money by, by others. And so I think the CPA committee could ask like, oh, I thought, you know, but I think so the way the trust has done it right this year, we didn't ask for additional consulting money because we had a balance. And so I think as long as we're, you know, we're aware of that, you know, we can't just every year keep saying, oh, we need more consulting money, more consulting money. And yet our balance is growing and we're not spending it. But I think if we ask when we need it, then it's justifiable. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, John. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, they could ask. I'm, I, I'd like to say that we can reason with them. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, aside from at some point, me understanding why this bottom line, because uh, I still don't, and maybe other people want to too. So do you have anything else to say about it, Nate? How we, if the 250 was in the 466, then? Yeah, I, you know, I'd have to, um, I think it would probably has to do with what the encumbrances were as of 930 and then see where some money may have been um, uh, liquidated. You know, there could have been some contracts that were then cleaned up, like I said, and then um, I can, I can get a detail expense and see exactly how it works, but. That would be great. I'd love to see that. Thank you. I mean, there's no uh, trickery. There's no trickery there. You know, it's not like we're. No, no I, I, I don't. Th I don't think there's trickery. I just like to like. I <laughs> feel like I really want to understand it. That's all. <laughs> and I see Erica has a hand up. I have a quick question. I think way back when, when we talked about the emergency rental um, program, uh, there was conversation about FEMA possibly reimbursing. <laughs> um some funds for that uh is that sort of over and done with and we didn't get any or um what's the status with that yeah no so the trust you know i'd voted two hundred fifty thousand for the rental assistance program and i think in the end in the end the trust maybe spent one hundred fifty thousand. so you know we fema did uh you know covid money did pay for that and so what we did uh, the trust originally we were paying out of the trust funds and then we started getting reimbursed and then we just started paying directly with uh, the COVID funding. So, you know, if, for instance, the, um, you know, if we needed to, the trust funding at some point would have been spent again, but we didn't, you know, we didn't have, there wasn't a need to do that. Okay. Allegra? Just so that I'm understanding if, say, the listening session or sessions were to involve some requests for funds, say for translation services, would that come out from like unrestricted account if the trust so desires to vote that way? Right. Yeah, that'd be the easiest, you know, to use it with that account, from that account. I mean, we could say technical services. I just would, you know, it'd be difficult for someone to say, well, how is that creating, preserving, or supporting affordable housing. And, you know, it'd just be easier to say, take it out of the unrestricted account. Yeah, yeah so even, you know, I'd emailed the trust members, um, you know, the Housing Institute, right, is in June, put on by Mass, um, Mass Housing Partnership. And so if trust members go to a training, you know, we have the unrestricted account or, you know, we can, we can support that, uh, you know, registration fees or even travel as long as there's receipts and everything. So that, that account could be used for that. I'm sorry, that comes out of the unrestricted account or that can be technical services? I would still try to use the unrestricted account just so that we're not, you know, having people raise eyebrows at what, what it is. <sighs> I don't yeah, care so, if they so, raise eyebrows, if we can spend it out of somewhere else. <laughs> but tech, I think that's fine though. I mean, the, you know, that's an interest bearing account that's as well. And, you know, so the technical services really would be right. We're like Ashley was saying, like, oh, there's a yeah, market. Okay. Let's, can we confirm the survey or something? And we hire someone to, you know, perform some type of outside service. Directly related to the creation of the affordable housing. I right. Think that's, the, that's the difference between that, that is. Yeah. those things and the kinds of things we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Erica. Yes. Yeah, so um, in terms of the CPA restricted words, interest earnings, 
Um, because it's interest earnings on CPA funds that are restricted, we can't move the interest earnings into the unrestricted? Um, yeah, I, I've been told no, <laughs> but then, you know, when, um, when I looked into it, I wasn't sure. So it's a good question. I thought, I thought you could, I thought we could move it into unrestricted, but I'm not, I'm not totally clear on that. It can, would be you nice ask, too, right? yeah. can you trial some more to find out the answer? I mean, if we can, that would be yeah, yeah, really yeah. good to know. I mean, so sometimes what's helpful with, with that is, you know, researching to what other trusts do just so then we can make a presentation to our, you know, our, our accounting department. Or, oh, that's a good so, idea. You know, I don't, you know, like I said, there's, you know, standard accounting practices, but I just want to want to make sure, see what other communities do. I mean, because the CPA is the major funder of housing trusts in Massachusetts. Um, okay, maybe we're ready to move on. Does anyone as an attendee or a trust member or anybody have anything that they else that they would like to say about this finance report? In that case, I will turn it back to Erica, who will turn it back our, to me. Take our, take our <laughs> next stab at whatever we're doing. It's the position. Talk about that. The position, the, yeah, the Right. Town trust so, position. Exactly. Sure. So before I, before Nate, before you talk uh, okay. about this, um, let me just say some of the questions we raised uh, prior, if we had a staff position to do some of the work, Nate, you'd probably have the answer so much quicker because we know you're overwhelmed. Um, so I think this position is really important that could really help us as well as the town really bring together some of the goals we have and, um, make them happen. So go ahead. Right. Yeah, I know Dave's here as well. If he, he may raise his hand at some point. So we did meet, um, we shared that, you know, the job description that we had last month. And so I didn't receive any additional comments. You know, I think there was a broad, you know, list of, you know, um, tasks and it covered quite a bit. It was really, I don't think it excluded anything. So I think, you know, it covered any, any tasks we may want the position to undertake. Mm -hmm. The, um, you know, the question really then comes down to, you know, was it full time and is it benefited? And so there is a requirement that anything over uh, 20 hours a week is benefited and it will be, it can be prorated, uh, you know, certain things can be prorated if it's not completely full time. Uh, so, you know, that's one consideration. A full time employee, there is a fringe rate. So, you know, the rate for benefits and everything, it's about We'll say 40%. So, you know, if someone's making $50,000 a year, 40% of that, an additional funding, you know, you don't see is supporting insurances, retirement, and everything else. And so it does add to the cost of, of the position, right? So if we say the trust has 20,000 and the town is, has 30,000 through CPA and we have $50,000 um, a year, we can, if it is benefited, then we just have to figure out, you know, how many hours and just back into that number, right? What, what the benefit cost will be. And so I think, you know, that's just, I mean, that's the discussion, right? So if it's, we think, it, if we think we need more than 20 hours a week or say it's 25 hours a week, then it's a, a part-time benefited position. And, um, you know, and then that's, that's that. And then we just, you know, we have to figure out I guess the pay range. And so, you know, it goes into, we have a whole chart for non-union positions. I'm assuming it's a non-union position. And then it, you know, we work with HR, we met with HR to figure out how it, how it, you know, factors in into that scale. So I don't, I don't know if there's any, you know, I know at one point the trust had said, well, let's try to make it full time. I think that would require maybe some additional funding because of the benefits. So at one point we thought, you know, we could have a, um, a full-time position that wasn't benefited if it was grant funded as say, this could be kind of considered, but that's not the case. Any position over 20 hours has to be benefited. That's what I saw would happen. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure, but that was, that was clarified. Uh, so there is a hand up uh, from one of, can't move over there. Somebody has their hand up. Yeah, that's John. John. Okay. Um, I, 
maybe I missed this, but I would like to know how much money the town is prepared to put into this. But we're not talking about the town doing anything beyond the CPA contribution that we have pending. Right. So the town, the CPA has already been voted the 30,000 a year for three years or you know, a little bit more than 30,000. So that's what the town has. There's no other funding in the operating budget or personnel budget for this position. Okay, so if we start with that, that would be a substantial part-time position that would be less than half-time, I assume, or it could be essentially a contracted position? No, it has to be, it's considered an employee, so it can't be a contract. Okay. But that, yeah. So at $30,000, you already have a, at least an employee, if not a full-time employee. Yeah. Okay. So then the question is, are there additional trust funds that could come out of our consulting line that would be applied so that we would make this a $40,000 a year position? That would be probably about what, 60% time? Or a little Gosh. hard to say. Especially if benefits are 40%, you're taking all, oh. I mean, that's like, however I much mean, you've got, you've got a lot less than that. Yeah. <laughs> $150,000, if it's 40%, you've got about 107 of it for salary. So you could say it's like that's a big chunk. Uh, what? Yeah, I mean, if we said 40,000 a year and it was benefited, um, and I'm doing 30% for benefits. 30%? Yeah, 30%. Just say because it's maybe not full time, it's not 100% full time. So it's prorated a bit. Then your actual salary is about 31,000. You know, the 9,000 yeah. going, is going to, um, to all the benefits and everything. And now, who directs this person's work? So they would work under in the planning department. Um, I would be a supervisor. And then, you know, in it, we say that they also, um, will you know, get direction from the co-chairs or the chairs of the trust, but they're directly supervised by me. Okay, I mean, historically in the past when we had a consultant, um, mostly I decided their tasks as the chair of the trust. So what we're saying is that in fact, Erica and Carol or Carol and Erica wouldn't directly determine what they're doing or what their priorities are. Oh, no, I think they would. I think the reporting and kind of the, the workflow of it is a little different. In the past, also, we would have them as contracts with the trust and not at an employee. So, you know, using the town funding, the CPA funding, it needs to be a town employee. It can't be a contract. So, you know, the way we've hired Rita uh, cannot, cannot happen anymore. It would actually, you'd actually have to be a town employee uh, you know, with a job description and, you know, fit into our job, you know, our non-union um, employee chart. So, you know, it's just, there was a change, you know, I think, right, Erica mentioned it last time, right, that took effect a year or two years ago, but what's happening now is it's being implemented by the municipality. So the way we hired even John Page was questionable now in terms of the new ruling. So, um, it makes it a little more difficult because, you know, right, we could have done this and said, oh, let's have a contract for someone for so many hours a week for two years, but that's just not possible anymore. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. So I guess that my question is, where are you... Are you actually working on coming up with something that does go through all those steps that you said, go to HR and figure out what it's going to cost and come and ask? I expected that at some point we would be asked, here's what we want to do and here's what we are, here's the money we're going to put into it. Here's what we need from you, Housing Trust. Do you want to do this? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's where we are. So last time the discussion was, you know, what's the, say, the wage of this position? how many hours a week and what really, you know, is it full time? Uh -huh. is it part time? And so I think that's really the decision process is, you know, the town has 30,000. 
uh, if it's over 20 hours a week, it needs to be benefited at a prorated amount. You know, what is the trust willing to to provide or support in, you know, for this position? And so uh, once that's made, I think we can figure out what say the hourly wages or what the salary is, and then um, and then we can advertise it. So the job description that I had last month, I could pull it up. I mean, that hasn't changed, right? So that's a, you know, if we think that looks good, that's the job description. We're working with HR. Uh, we have an idea of where it could fit into this, you know, the employee chart. And then it's now figuring out kind of what what we assume, what we think is the right amount of time or funding to apply to this position. Well, I at least would want to see the job. I thought we had made some suggestions last time that didn't seem to be in the job description we looked like, like the proactiveness we wanted to see on trying to find things. So I don't want to say anything without seeing the job description again, not right now on the screen, but at a time when we can actually think about it. Uh, um, and I don't know, I guess if our, we could have a proposal that says, here's how much of our money we're willing to spend on this and let you go from there. I don't know if exactly we're ready to do that either. I guess my off the top of my head idea is I would be willing to spend a bunch of what's in the consulting services line, maybe if I like the job description enough and if I like the way that it seems like it's going to interact between the town and the trust. But that's a lot of ifs. And that's just me. That's not everyone else in the trust. So I'm interested to hear what other people are thinking. I think that we're spending a lot of time on the particulars of this job when we should, you know, fund them well, and most importantly, hire them quickly, and then also have some provisions that they meet with the chairs weekly, or that they are reporting to somehow us, well, monthly, but that this gets going soon. So that, I mean, I'm for all the money. Money doesn't mean that much to me. We have a lot of money. So like, let's just put a lot of money into it and hire this person, like tomorrow. Um, right. Somebody else, Erica? Yeah, um, I was just curious because um, Carol, you mentioned the consulting line. Uh, is that the line that we have to use in order to fund this position? It's not necessarily, but you know, there's a balance there. So, if, you know, the trust said 15,000 a year for three years, that's covered already in the balance in that line. So, you know, but it could be from other, other accounts, other lines. Yeah. So the, the struggle that I'm having is um, the amount versus how much time do we actually think we need this person for? Um, you know, if if we were to have this individual do all the things that we've already been talking about, I mean, there's the inventory, there's the being proactive, there's possibly, you know, uh, checking in with developers to see what they're doing. There's, you know, making sure that the the um, projects that we have were on top of that. Um, there's just so much that this individual can do. So the question, like we're working backwards, we're saying, well, how much money do we have? And then we know that we're gonna have this person 25, um, you know, hours or whatever. I'm wondering if it seems to me we have enough for a full-time individual, which then means, okay, we have to come up with more money. And are we willing to come up with more money? Um, I'm willing to come up with enough money if we have it to get somebody who can actually help us move on a lot of these um, items that we that we've raised. I second that. Let's give her like or him fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year full time, plus benefits. Have, have we bench? Have we benchmarked this position again? So the positions that are there, I, I'm not, could be that we we talked about this and I just can recall and see what other trusts, um, you know, around the country are doing, and see how much they're paying them in a town similar to Amherst that has the the standard of living, and then we can then once we benchmark it, then we can figure out what which way to go, how much to pay them, I and mean, then of course we want to pay somebody a very good livable wage, but I think benchmarking it would be the best way to, to go because there's gotta be other positions out there around the country or even in Massachusetts that are similar to what we're trying to do here. 
Yeah, that's a good point. I think at one point we had, and but not recently. So I think that's something we could look into. I mean, so HR was going to, they can help facilitate that a little bit. Um, but I think that's something I, we staff can also look into. When you do look into that and have the information, could you send it to all of us? Um, I think it'd be important because we're going to end up waiting till April to make a decision. And it seems like, you know, you and we could really use a person. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I was going to say, I do have um, right a, a few communities in the last, you know, say six months have advertised for a housing planner uh, in, in Massachusetts. So I have that saved you know, just to see, you know, it's say similar, um, just to see what that is. So I have, I have that. And then we can also look at what some communities have this as a CPA housing administrator or some other things. So we can, we can do that kind of comparison and benchmarking, Sid. I mean, I will say that, you know, a full-time position, if you're saying 50,000 a year and we're at um, our, you know, percentage for, um, for benefits and everything, really, that's seventy thousand dollars we need a year. So that you know, that's forty thousand a year from the trust, and so that is a significant amount of funding. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say that that's not, the position isn't worth it, but that's you know, that's a that's a you know, the trust would have to say, well, we can allocate forty thousand a year for three years for that, and so that's where you know, I, I do think it's important to say if it's thirty hours a week and it's prorated benefits, and the trust gives fifteen um thousand then we're at you know uh you know uh, this is kind of where the rate is and so i mean eric i, I agree maybe there's enough for full time some of it is it may be you know maybe we uh let's figure out how we advertise it um you know it could be that the first year is not as many hours right if depending on how they're getting up to speed and what the tasks are and then you know actually they once they get more familiar there's and knowledgeable there's definitely a lot that can happen i just don't want to um, you know, unlike a contract worker, say gets paid for the hours they work, we have to make sure we right we have a clear a clear job description and a clear set of hours that they work um, and that they are you know it's, it's a it's a good use of time. And unfortunately, it has to be a position that we're saying we are we can fund this for X number of years, and after that, who knows what happens next? And then the town doesn't have money anymore after that. Maybe the trust doesn't have money after that either. Uh, so that might make it a hard sell. I don't know how to get this to be more concrete, which is what I would really I, mean, I like think. I think a three year position, though, is, uh, you know, that's a pretty good. I mean, I think the, the town's idea is that if this is something that is fruitful and works well, that we would try to see how it can be funded, right? But, um, you know, there's always CPA funding, although we said we would try to figure out other funding mechanisms. But I mean, to me, a three year, uh, three years is a is pretty good job security. Knowing that if you're there, you have three years of funding. I don't, I don't see that as a discouragement. And who knows? Maybe the legislation around um, the transfer fees will come, and that could be a possibility as well. Um, yeah. but maybe what we need is, do you think maybe a subgroup to work with you on this? Just yeah, I mean, to I think would be. I, I do think having some level of funding the trust to be comfortable with on an annual basis is important because then that we can kind of figure out, okay, if it's 45,000 total, you know, what does that look like at, you know, say, you know, I can back that out. So, it's, you know, 45,000 a year is about uh, 45,000 a year total is about 35,000 in salary because, you know, we're backing out up 30% for fringe. And so, I mean, I think that's, Kind of where we can start and then figure out what you know how that fits into the pay scale the, the employee pay scale with hr okay so i think what and, i'm hearing is oops go ahead carol i just wanted to see if i could be clear about what uh, i'm looking back at your finance report can we use money in any of these lines that we feel like for this purpose or are there only some lines that could be used for this and if so which are they well i mean i think I think any of the lines really, but, you know, consulting services is probably the most relevant. The idea mm -hmm. though is that this position, right, could be actually working on getting projects developed. So then the development funds could, could, um, could be used. And so I don't, you know, I, I think really any, any line can be used. It's just, I think the most 
appropriate, it would be the consulting services. Yeah, okay. But there's okay. not some restriction that makes it so we can't use other one. No, no. Okay, thank you. So I don't see any other hands up. Wait a minute. Oh, there is a hand up. <laughs> John. Hey, John, you can unmute yourself. It's not of us. We're talking about town funds and uh, trust funds. The, tr the town funds are actually funds that come from CPA that were allocated to both the mm -hmm. trust and the town jointly. The whole idea that was pitched to the housing trust was that these are funds that uh, the town and the trust would figure out how to spend for an employee or consultant jointly so that um, it's not as if that piece of the funding doesn't belong to the trust as well. So, John, are you saying that the amount that was given to the town um, is is also up for grabs in terms of this position, supporting this position? Yes, it was given jointly to the town and the trust to uh, support a position, the part-time position that the town had uh, proposed. The idea was that this was a joint project between the town and the trust not simply a town position and this was about a year ago correct uh yeah maybe even a little bit more I the other remember. thing i should say that i'm concerned about and nate you may have some comment about this as i look at your involvement in other planning department activities it seems like that keeps expanding that you're doing a lot more on zoning than you were doing a year or two years ago and so that's a significant increased demand on your time. So the question I have in my mind is to what extent is this person going to kind of backfill for tasks that you no longer have the time to do because of the increasing demand for your participation in planning for zoning? Which yeah, I mean, I think that could, yeah, that could be some of it. Some of it also is, for instance, with the new inclu inclusionary zoning bylaw, we're getting, you know, almost every larger project is required to have affordable units. And so that's, you know, taking more time to coordinate. And so, you know, even just trying to develop more projects. So the Strong Street, pro you know, for instance, the Strong Street site. So I don't think, I don't see it as much as backfilling as, as kind of augmenting the services we're providing and the, our, our level of um, ability to expand and preserve housing. So. You know, it's things that I would want to work on, but that this position can really further it. So even if, you know, there's uh, expiring uses, they can really spend time researching that and looking at it. They could find properties that are appropriate for habitat and really spend time digging into it and say, okay, here's, you know, five sites that can work, you know, and, and really, you know, coordinate with habitat. So, you know, I, I've done that on a, say, a cursory level a while ago and said, here's, you know, four sites. What do you think? And, and, you know, maybe this position could do a little bit more research in terms of certain things, um, you know, and even looking at, um, you know, doing some due diligence on the properties or coordinating that due diligence. So I see it as really augmenting and expanding the ability of the town to, and the trust to increase affordable housing. Any other comments or feedback? So I think what I heard you say, Nate, is one that you are going to look to see what other towns, comparable towns have in terms of this type of position, take a look at it in terms of salary and hours, um, and then come back to us in terms of what you think would be a reasonable contribution from us to make sure that we can get that quality of person to be working for us. I mean, I just heard you say a lot of different um, responsibilities that are going to take a lot of time. Um, and I, I love the fact that you talk about augmenting, um, because I think it is really important to think about every avenue to create affordable housing. And I know the zoning bylaws is also a huge area to have impact on that. Um, so you want to come back to us? 
Can you tell us how soon? Yeah, I mean, I think next month we can, you know, I, I was just trying to run some numbers while you're talking, you know, saying like, oh, if the trust put in, you know, if we had 45,000 a year and they work 30 hours a week, you know, what what's a good hourly, you know, what, what does that break down per hour? And I was coming up with, um, you know, you know, I was trying to figure that out anyway. So yeah, I think that's something we could, we could maybe have like a, a you know, a few things like that. So if, you know, 15,000 a year, if 20,000 a year, if so many hours a week and just kind of provide a table to show what that looks like in terms of, you know, a wage and benefits and um, yeah. And I think that's, that could be helpful. And then at the same time, we could have a comparison of what other, how other communities fund this. Okay. All right. Um, Carol. I'm sorry. I just thought I remembered back from some point earlier on in this conversation that somebody said it, there are some threshold of hours that we need to meet reach in order for the position to be attractive enough. Maybe it was something you, so yeah. So I kind of sounds like we could find things for somebody to do full time. The question is what can we kind of both afford and where's the line between being able to afford it and making it attractive enough so somebody's going to want to do it. So that's just another thing to think about. Yeah, I think we did have this conversation and I think I remember Risa saying that there might be people who are already doing some hours and be interested in possibly part-time work. Um, and I think what we had said is possibly thinking about preferable this number of hours, but you know, we would consider in terms of the applicants because we we may get lots of applicants, we may not get lots of applicants. Um, so that's the other piece. Um, so I think there's a you know there's a way if we can be flexible enough to say that we would prefer applicants who can work X number of hours, but we would consider um, other applicants as well. I mean I don't know if that's a possibility with the town in HR. Yeah, I think yeah I mean I, I think those are all good questions. I, I so we're, you know we can have another meeting with HR. I agree. I. I feel like there needs to be some flexibility in the description and I just, I'm not sure right what, how, how much we can have. Okay. But yeah, so sure. I, think, I think that's a good question. Okay, so you're gonna come back with us with a table that's gonna show us sort of wage benefits hours in comparison to other uh, comparable towns that have positions like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if you can get them, you know, if, if you have that before our next meeting, that'd be really great um, because I, I think we all agree that we really need a person like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean the town. You know, we're also we're also anxious. I know the CPA committees will ask soon as well. So it's something we'd love to get get going to. I think Carol, you're next. Um. Yeah, I don't know how long this is going to take. Someone, what we were asked by probably Ashley to have a chance to talk again about the duplex triplex bylaw proposal. And uh, I know from having gone to the, one of the planning meetings at which they were considered that it is very much a work in progress. The stuff that I sent to you, I don't think is anywhere near whatever the final proposal is going to be. I don't know what that's going to be. I think that uh, the two, Mandy and Pat, I think are meeting with the planning department tomorrow to try to iron out some of whatever in the world is going to go next. So what I thought I would like to give us the chance to do is just kind of almost from scratch in a way, think about some of the, are there things that we saw in this proposal? I sent all the bunch of stuff out again, but there's nobody here at the moment to present it. Are there things that we saw in here that seemed like they would be important to have included in um, whatever goes forward. And are there things in here that we think would be really bad? So it's just kind of a general chance to say this part of what's going on here, it seems like really the right direction or something or other seems like it's rather the wrong direction. And if that's so vague that no one has anything to say, that's possible too. But anyway, I wanted to provide the opportunity and I have a few things I will say, but I'll let somebody else have a chance first. 
Ashley, you have a well, hand. Well, basically, I don't remember them actually kind of telling us what it has to do with affordable housing. So they want to create more units. That is just housing. If we're not getting any affordable units out of this, then what does it really have to do with us? What are they asking from us? What are the affordable housing trust fund board? What are they, what are they giving affordable housing wise? <clears throat> I, well, I think that the thought was that there needs to be more possible kinds of housing available that will impact affordability kind of indirectly, but in the way that zoning can so that there are maybe fewer neighborhoods that feel somehow exclusive or something. Um, but they came, they came to us because actually, I think I said, I thought that the housing trust for those kinds of reasons might be a good ally. And perhaps I was wrong, although I still have a lot of some things about it that I like, but um, <clears throat> they're not really asking anything from us. They're asking if we are in support of what they're doing or not. And I see two more hands, so Allegra. Um, I certainly echo what Ashley said. I think I would support a bylaw that allowed for either owner occupied or affordable units to be built. But I think that when you get into the territory of non owner occupied, and I guess by exclusion of the word affordable in that, um, I just worry that we're just going to be building more $4,000 a month, two bedroom units on top of each other that will just continue to price people who can't afford that out. So I think in terms of looking at it as the affordable housing trust, I think the provisions need to be favoring development of affordable units of housing um so that's those are my two cents okay risha yeah i i mean i'm i suspect like a lot of you the the conversation and the the proposal from last month has been sitting with me for a while now and and i'm interested i think one of the things that was sitting with me and, and nate i don't remember if you said this in this meeting or if you were quoted in one of the newspaper articles, but something around like we would need, and there was a number on it, like 7,000 new units before we'd start to really feel right. Like that would still most likely all go to, to students. Um, that that the, the gap between what we need um, and where we are is so big that there's just an enormous need. And I, I guess I am A, supportive, of reducing single family home zoning in the town. I think that that is a positive towards a more affordable housing. The indirectness of build more, it becomes affordable is a long time coming if I've understood our economics properly, um, that there can be a lot of very high end units before we start to, to shift that supply and demand curve. Um, and I thought I read in the latest, um, I, I admit I didn't dig into it as detailed as I did the earlier one, but I thought I saw that it's looking like it, it, they are now looking at the owner occupied um, zoning as a preference. So that was good. I guess my lingering question is what are the zoning possibilities for more larger apartment complexes? If I've understood correctly, that was sort of taken away 20, 30 years ago. And are they now? Is there a way to use this moment to, to actually start trying to build lots and lots and lots of more from a zoning standpoint, not just an affordability standpoint? Thanks. Yeah, if I may quickly, yeah, Risha, I think that's the last point I'll speak to the planning board met, I don't know, a week or two ago and kind of had that conversation, you know, where can we allow uh, much more dense housing in town, whether that's 
in the village centers or could we actually come up with a student housing overlay? I'll just call it that, right? Let's where can we put student housing? Because the market in Amherst is really off balance with the demand for student housing. And, you know, when I say that, I'm not saying that, you know, there's positives, positives and negatives from the university. When I'm talking about housing, I'm just saying it's the, the student pressure on the housing market is really, um, you know, insurmountable almost. And it's not, you know, it's not saying anything against the university or students, right? But it's just that there, there's so many students that need housing that they drive the price up. And so when I say like, gosh, it's bad for housing, it's just because of that, right? So students can pay per bedroom much more than anyone else can typically pay. And so that's, that's a, that it's really hurting Amherst more than other communities because of the proximity to UMass. And so the housing production plan and the housing market study said, right, that there's this imbalance and you know, whether that was caused because of things that changed 40 or 50 years ago and the lack of supply and, you know, that all that may be true, but it's hard to say, let's just make some changes and it's going to automatically change, right? And so I think the planning department and what was voiced at the planning board when they discussed this was concerned. And I think it was said here as well, Rob, you mentioned it, was that, like Risha said, that these units, if there aren't provisions for owner occupancy or for affordability, it's just going to become student housing, just because the opportunity choices, students would prefer to live closer to UMass. So, you know, the impact might be that Belchertown or, you know, Deerfield or Greenfield might see fewer students, right, who are living 20 to 30 minutes away, but there's still really high demand in Amherst for housing. Um, you know, so I, I think that part of this proposal generated some great discussion that the planning board had wanted to have and they're having now. And so they're meeting again at the end of the month to talk more about where could we allow for say student housing? Where could we allow for um, you know, different densities of housing? And, and then there's this piece, uh, which is you know, the zoning proposal is looking at duplexes, triplexes. So they simply said three units in a building. Right now we call in our zoning triplexes, three units or more is an apartment building. And so the, they were saying, well, let's have duplexes, triplexes and then apartments is four or more and then townhouses and then you know there's owner occupied or non-owner occupied or affordable and so you know we're meeting right we're meeting with staff meeting with uh, mandy and pat tomorrow and i think there are pieces right that could be uh, researched and might be good to implement it's just i'm not sure i think sometimes there needs to be a corollary to it which is also allowing student housing or some other pieces or maybe there's some other regulations that might be non-zoning that maybe limits the density of student rentals, right? Is there a distance requirement between student rentals? And so I think it's hard to say no all the time and say, because we need more housing, but then when someone proposes it and we're like, oh no, but we can't because of this and that it seems like we're, we're stalling something that we know should happen. But I think the worry is that there's gonna be unintended consequences of it. And then it's hard to reverse it quickly. And so, you know, I, I, for me, it's like, wow, I think we're having these conversations. And so let's have more of them with different groups. And maybe we can come up with a bunch of solutions that can happen at once so they all can work. And so, you know, I would hate to move forward and have allowed non owner occupied triplexes everywhere in town. And then after a year, we have, you know, 15 triplexes going up along Bay Road and they're just all student rentals. And, you know, each triplex has, you know, 12 bedrooms and 12 students. And we have just, you know, we're pushing, we're getting students in places where we didn't expect them. And maybe it's better to look at it, you know, with all these different tools and techniques at once. Um, so yeah, you know, I don't know, I don't, you know, I think in general, it's like, wow, this looks, this makes sense, right? I think we could say, wow, this is great. We want to have different types of housing in Amherst. And then maybe it's the details that start getting, you know, you really have to consider. And so I think generally, you know, if someone had said a year ago and said, yeah, I would say, yeah, this sounds like a great idea. Let's have more duplexes. And if we have design guidelines, so they look like single family homes and they're not, you know, say a track duplexes, like these are really attractive and it's great. And then someone could say, well, what about the students? And then, you know, all these little variables start creeping in. And, and so I, I you know, I, I, so I think the ideas are good and it's just all this, you know, the mechanical pieces that really need to be refined and, you know, the affordability piece is interesting. How do we require it on a duplex, you know, to be quote, capital A affordable means it's deed restricted. It's going through the state. It's affirmably marketed. You have to hire a third party to do that. And it becomes really cumbersome on a duplex, 
you know, essentially it's a context then, you know, you're kind of minimizing it if it's home ownership. And so I, I, I do think we'd have to have some provisions for affordability, but could we have a higher income limit? So it's not on the subsidized housing inventory, you know, it's not capital A affordable, it's lowercase a affordable. And could we manage that? Because I think there's housing we need for different income levels. Um, um, okay, I got two people, two people attendees who want to say something and then I want to say something, but go ahead and do John right. and Grover. John, you can unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, I've been thinking about this a bit, and I want to reinforce what everybody else has said, but then take another step. Listening to Allegra before talking about, well, how is this going to impact positively on affordable housing? It occurred to me to say, or to think, wait a second, it's not only not going to impact positively, but it's going to impact negatively. And not only on big A affordable housing, but the kind of more modest income housing that I know that Mandy and Pat are both interested in. We understand right now there's tremendous competition for housing resources in the state and the nation and also in Amherst. There's tremendous competition for land and for building materials and for labor and for all of those things. And as a consequence, to the extent that we open things up to allow for the development of more housing, all we're going to do is play into that existing market uh, economy and make it harder to do affordable housing because affordable housing and modest income housing will lose out in the competition for those resources that are devoted as we kind of expand the opportunities for any housing in Amherst. So I really think this is going to do the opposite of what the proposers want and that what any of us would want for housing. Can I ask a question? Is there is there any limit on um, how many houses a person can own that is full of students? Like, can you just keep buying house after house after house? You only live in one, and the next 10 are full of students. Is that legal? Yeah. There's no limit. There's no like legal or anything limit. Um, so we got two more hands, however. Rob? It's just that if we make more houses, that person buys more houses and fills them with students. Like it just that's it, right it just opens up like oh that's what john that's what john was just saying i think so yeah I mean, right i mean so yeah well, actually i think I, right it's interesting staff have said that the people who would have the equity or the means to buy land or build houses are the ones who already own <laughs> own um a few <laughs> houses because they can quickly you know they have the collateral and so there isn't a limit i think that if you are building um, say a duplex and it's non-owner occupied, there's a special permit requirement. So the ZBA asks for a management plan and asks for a number of things that make it so that, you know, say me, you know, me and my wife can't run 20 properties because we really can't manage them. So we'd have to hire a management company. And so the ZBA through the permitting process can have some conditions that would say that even if it's owned by a single family, um, you know, say a private individual or family, there is management and there is other resources that are going to the management and maintenance of those properties beyond what that family can do, right? Because it's just, they own too many. And so I think the permitting process tries to safeguard that a little bit, but in terms of how many someone can own, there's no limit. So we got a couple more people to hear from and some other things on our agenda. So Rob. I forgot to say that first. Oh, yep. What? So Grover, right? Rob is, did you take your hand down, I guess, or? He had said that the other hand was up first, the public, so. Oh, well, I was calling on the trust member first, I, but okay, <laughs> Grover. <laughs> okay, I'm happy to wait till Rob's done, but. Um, well, he hi, wants to wait till you're done, so go for it. Okay, great. So, hi, everyone. My name is Grover, and um, I moved here a year ago from back here from the Oakland, California area. And I worked for an affordable housing advocacy organization there and spent 
um, most of my two and a half years there um, as part of these kinds of debates and research and advocacy about whether or not adding more housing and more density that's market rate, how it affects affordable housing. And I have a lot of thoughts and experience and articles that I can share at some other time, but I wanted to say that um, you know, a city council member came and talked to me about this topic already, and I just wanted to put forth that experience that we gained when I was working at East Bay Housing Organizations is that the data shows that building housing without just like letting developers build whatever housing they want at whatever density they want doesn't actually bring down the cost of housing. So there was massive apartment buildings of like 80, 90, 100 units where half of them were empty and the, the developer had no incentive to rent it out for a lower cost, even though nobody would pay to live in those $5,000 apartments. And they just stood empty next to the highway, making everyone mad while more and more people came, became unhoused. And so we certainly don't want that to happen. And at the same time, I see around me and firmly believe that more and more people are moving here and will be moving here. And people will move into the more and more housing that's affordable, quote unquote, affordable to them and outside of the range that a person with that income would normally live in, thereby making it unaffordable on the you know market rate housing for people with lower incomes. So I personally do believe that we need to have options to build more housing and build them more densely. So there's not lots all around us filled with, you know, 5,000 square foot single family homes. Instead, you could put three apartments there and, and that's great. I would love to own a, a home like that here. And that can happen through, I think, a, how do I say? I think you have an opportunity right now to advocate for a suite of housing bills that actually combines uh, tenant rent caps, the number of units that a, um, a, an LLC sort of can own, like can you own a hundred units in Amherst? Can you own a thousand? Can you own 4,000, right? Like the city has the capacity to decide. And also what Nate was saying, like the space between student housing or the responsibility of a landlord who has student housing so that trash isn't everywhere. So that, you know, there's, there's some kinds of extra requirements for upkeep. Um, I would encourage uh, using the leverage that you have in this moment of opening because I think it, it does need to happen. Grover, do you have a job? Because we, we might have a job for you. <laughs> we need people to, like, we need to hire someone that knows this stuff. Because apparently we're not experts. We need someone, like, that did it. <laughs> I do have a full, full-time job. Um, but more on that later. I think I'm having a conversation with some of these people in a couple weeks. <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. I, li I like it already. Because it basically, that makes sense just in a basic like intuition thing we need more housing but if we're not getting affordable housing out of it it's not helping like we gotta like make people have affordable housing in their plans rob um so one of the things that i think uh, might be being overlooked by the proponents is is that this uh scale um, um, up, up zoning or down zoning, whatever it is, down zoning, I guess, up zoning um, is potentially uh, doing end around um, the 40 hour process. In other words, it's it's reducing the, the, the possibility that we could uh, find a 40 hour project to work in, in Amherst because 40 hour requires um, that, you, that, you, that you do an up zone. But if you've already up some, it's harder to do a further up some. So, so if there is a, a place in town where it's appropriate for, you know, a bunch of you know, for high density housing, if we've already allowed townhouses to be built there, then then the 40 R opportunity is lost. The 40 R, um, you know, has a required affordable component, and it also comes with incentives from the state. So, so that that. Um, that 
element shouldn't be forgotten. It should not make it, yeah. So we don't want to not have the 40 R's happen. Right. I mean, they right, get right, us so affordable. Like, they get us affordable units. So, right, so Rob was saying, right? I, we just we we just showed them our hand, right? So it's like, right? We, you know, uh, the other year the trust worked and we had Karen and a consultant look at 40 R in downtown, but in the in most most of those zones, we already allow almost like full build out of a property to five floors, and there's actually there's no way to increase the density unless you go to seven floors, right? And we're just, and so there was no incentive to increase density, which also then would get affordable units. But if we had a 40 R right in other places in town where, you know, you are limited to building single family homes or duplexes, but now all of a sudden we're saying, if you have a good development, you could get, you know, eight units an acre, 12 units an acre, 20 units an acre, much more density than is allowed. The developer would say, great, the caveat is they have to, you know, provide 20% affordable units, but they're getting the dent so much more density than they would typically be allowed that it, there's an incentive there. And so it's interesting, Rob, I hadn't thought of it that, you know, right, we're, we're actually, you know, if we don't have affordability provisions, we're actually kind of disincentivizing something like that. And so, um, you know, when we were looking at 40R, I was actually, right, some, I think, Rob, you had said it was, let's actually reduce the height in the BG and then, put that height in the 40R because that's the incentive. And, you know, I think 40R still is a really interesting idea and, um, you know, whether or not we call it 40R, but I think having some, some mechanisms like that as part of right, right, some zoning changes would be really important to consider. Um, I got George Ryan wants to say something. Hey, George, you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Sorry, I just need a Grover's last name. Oh, Wellman Brown, W-E-H-M-A-N-Brown. -E -E Thank you. Oh, right, you can't see that as an attendee. Sorry. Right. Yeah, we, I know. We have What's guests the... and it's hard to, right? Yeah, so. I have a question. I, I, Okay, um, Ashley. Do we have like a basic meeting where um, like once a year or maybe I missed it like when it happened, but um, that is, you know, like what are our goals? I mean, we're hiring new, a person. Like, is there like a, a basic overall, what are we doing here? What do we think affordable housing even is? Um, that kind of meeting that is like kind of goal setting for like a whole year. Do we do that? We have had a strategic plan. It's kind of outdated, but our, our goal of late has been X number of more affordable units in town. Our goals are pretty much, have been pretty much uh, focused on getting more affordable units. We could, of course, and we've, we certainly haven't gotten in as many as we ever wanted to get in previous times. So we're still kind of working on those. And there's a, <clears throat> we have a mission statement that's associated with, it's on the website, I think, with where it talks about the, <clears throat> um, the trust. And we could, if we, I don't know, we could at some point and uh, try and have another a renewed strategic planning process. I mean, mostly it's kind of, we know we need more affordable housing, let's get it, is a but short think, version think, of it. So it, yeah, I think the like some of the issue is that we're not really dealing with the impediments to affordable housing. Like just building new housing is kind of, um, that's gonna happen anyway. And we it's not even happening in an affordable way, but, the impediments to just, maybe we need to not just build, but to create, find ways that are a little more creative that are different. Like, I think we need some strategic planning and just building is not getting us very much. Like it's getting us, what, 40, 50 units a year? What do we, I mean? So, it's definitely something that we could think about trying to find some other alternative ways. 
probably not right this minute, but it's not a bad idea. Erica? Um, just to answer the, the question, um, usually at the beginning of the year, um, usually starting sort of at the end of the summer, uh, I remember we went through the strategic plan in terms of the goals. And I think part of what we had asked for is to see if anybody wanted to help develop the next um, iterator, iteration of the strategic plan. Um, I think, you know, as Carol said, maybe not here, but to maybe in our next meeting or meeting afterwards, think about possible retreat where we can just go over the plan that we had and what is that we want to do for the future. But I think what would be helpful, uh, and I think Carol's going to mention this, is that there are going to be a couple of sessions. I'm going to go to one uh, in March on the Affordable Housing 101, and then there's going to be a Housing Institute. I think it would probably behoove us before we come together and rethink what the next sort of five years looks like for us, short term, medium term, and long term, that you know that some of us, not all of us, some people are very clear about um, all the different mechanisms and leverages that we can use to really think through that and then come together maybe at maybe at the end of June uh, to plan the coming year. Okay. Okay. Um, it looks like we are kind of past whatever time we wanted to do. I think that we can, one of these things we can probably table. I guess the only thing I wanted to say about the proposals that we have in front of us or the, the zoning stuff is I would really like to see it be not any more difficult if I buy a house lot to build a duplex on it than to build a single family home. I don't think that should be harder. I don't think if I live in a house that I bought a while ago and all my kids are gone and I decide I need some extra income and I want to change it into my place and someplace else and make a rental in it. I don't think that should be harder either. So there's some just little things like that that feel to me like inroads into, into um, diversifying the housing that's in different communities that I would like to see not get lost in the shuffle of all of the things that are so difficult about, about the things that are being proposed here. So that's the, just what I wanted to say. If we can, I'd like, I'd like to move on um, and turn it back over to Erica which maybe is something, this is a thing I think maybe we don't even need to do, but Erica, you, it's yours, go for it. Sure, um, uh, thank you, Ashley, for uh, organizing. Uh, I think it's Jennifer Randolph who's gonna come in Margaret. April to talk. Margaret Randolph? I thank you. Maggie, Maggie Randolph, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Ms. Randolph, <laughs> um, it, or however she identifies. Um, is going to come in April to talk about tiny houses, but we thought we would open up to see if there are any particular questions that maybe Ashley you could bring to Ms. Randolph um, so um, the person can be prepared to answer some of the questions that we may have. Because um, I think it'll, it'll be a very interesting conversation. Um, Ashley shared documents um, about the tiny, house, tiny houses and how it's being developed in New Hampshire. Um, so it might be helpful to have some questions or if there are any particular areas that you want this individual to cover with us, um, it might help to prep for that. And so we thought well, we'd just over here. I mean, a few things is that um, like per unit, how much is it costing? And then also, can it be a hybrid of rentals and to buy? So, you know, tiny houses, you could buy them outright but then some could be rented and potentially and then also could we own the land i mean and we as in can the can the can the town of amherst own the land and just kind of lease it to um someone or just plain own it because then someone or except for when someone's buying their house they're buying kind of like the land it's on but then the person that's renting it is the land still is Amherst's. Maybe the house, maybe the Amherst Community Land Trust could take it. Yeah, I think, you know, the plans were sent around for the tiny homes. Yeah, I mean, I think actually the question about the per unit cost and some of it would be just, you know, 
I guess if you did communicate with um, the Randolphs, I don't know if her husband would be here. I think he was the builder and she helped. Um, she was part of it as well. But I think just letting them know that we would be interested in, you know, some of those, you know, I don't, I don't want to say it's like sensitive, but, you know, the economics of it, you know, kind of their kind of their motivation, you know, if they are, I think now, I thought they're, I think they're all rentals now. I thought at one point they're going to be ownership, but I think a recent article I saw said they're rentals. So the question would be, you know, like, you know, are they long-term leases? You know, what's, would they be willing to share what their monthly rates are? Are any of them like short-term rentals like Airbnb because of where their market is? And so I guess if we, if, I mean, if, if you reached out to her just to, you know, say that we may be asking those questions, if hopefully they're comfortable answering them, that's all. Cause you know, I don't, if she's here and she doesn't really want to share some of those pieces, it's like, okay, well, we want to get kind of that, some of that more detailed information than what we, we you know, than what we can glean from reading the articles online. It'd be great to know, right? What is the per unit cost and would they do it again? I mean, those are the things, right? It's really interesting. I mean, I'm assuming every one of those units has their own utilities run to it. So essentially it's like a mini subdivision. I mean, they're running water, sewer or whatever. And those are the things I'd like to know, And right? What is their per unit cost or square foot cost? and how did that compare to say, you know, if their husband's a builder, what does that compare to say building single family homes in that area? Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's interesting. I, I, it's in Dover, New Hampshire for the people listening. And I, yeah, it's not shown on aerial, on aerial images, as far as I can tell, there's that they don't have updated aerials in that area, but I was hoping to see something. Um, I'll keep looking to see if I can find anything. It'd be great to get, you know, real life pictures. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess, I mean, it may be one thing is that I'm hoping it's as flexible as possible because it would re I think it would really help us to own the land and then we would um, be able to build more on it. It's not like, I mean, who, you know, everything's flexible, but if we have several acres, like 4.5 that I just saw online, it doesn't, the tiny home village doesn't necessarily take up all those acres. We can use some of it and then we can use, put other things on it. I mean, if if the town owns the land, true? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's typically the town will enter into a long-term ground lease with the developer because if it's town owned land, it gets a little tricky with some of that. So, um, but yeah, there's, there's ways to make, have a development have, um, you know, housing and other open space or, you know, I think, we've often talked about having a combination of, you know, conservation area and housing. They can be really great together, not, you know, it can be a win-win or recreation and housing. Uh, Tim had his hand up, but looks like, Tim, you put your hand down. I just wanna make sure we didn't skip you if you wanted to speak. Okay, looks like Tim does not wanna speak. Um, Okay, I think just uh, in terms of time, we're at 8.45 and we have a few more things to cover. So thank you, Ashley, so much for making that connection and we really look forward to talking to the Randolphs. Carol? And I think actually, actually, Ashley, uh, you wanted to talk about um, the draft recommendations from Governor Healy on the Housing Working Group. I don't know if you still want to do that or what you want to do with it. Like, there's not very much time at the moment. So, well, if maybe I, you want to just sure, tell us to just, all go and look at it. I don't know. Right. <laughs> I mean, I was just very impressed with the basic um, concepts. One was a real urgency that she put in. She used the word urgency, and that's like key. There's a housing crisis it's urgent, we need to hire people, we need to build. And then also, like I just read an article just right after um, that her you know, framework that also like it specifically said, there's a lot of old mills in this area and buying an old mill is probably cheaper. The article didn't say this, but I'm just saying, I wonder if buying old mills and buying old buildings is cheaper than building from scratch so that's what i'm saying is that we need to hire this person but they need to take a deep dive on like what is the affordable housing crisis in western mass look like and then report to us the like deep details of like not just what people are doing by to build new housing but 
what are people doing to solve the affordable housing crisis in their you know towns and cities because it's not it's clearly not just building we there's lots of ways to do, like create housing move people around without just building new buildings yeah thanks so I, um, Nate sent the link, so we've all got a chance to look at that and we can look at it further. And I will pass it to Erica. Very quickly. Um, so I think last time we had a meeting, um, uh, it looked like uh, both uh, Carol and myself, actually in Rob, um, were up for reappointment. Um, Sid's term was going is going to be over in June. And Sid, I believe that you've expressed that you probably are not well that you're that you're not going to um, continue with the trust to provide an opportunity for our others um, to possibly be on the trust. We're going to start interviews. Uh, we have one vacancy right now. Um, that we need to uh, fill. And uh, Carol, myself, and a couple of others will be interviewing uh, three candidates. All three candidates are excellent candidates, lots of different experience around affordable housing, uh, housing. Um, so pretty excited. Um, I think whoever um, we get in terms of two positions, maybe we can push for one more, but I know that's um, that's set by bylaw. But uh, if we can um, definitely get at least uh, two more um, vacancies filled, that would be excellent. So um, just wanted to give you a progress report that we're actually moving on it, that we have the interviews set up. Angela Mills has um, set those, scheduled those, and um, hopefully by our next meeting, we may have some good news. Thanks. So um, we come to the part of our meeting, I believe, unless somebody has something important to say else, where we have some announcements. I have some, other people may have some. What I can tell you is uh, there is the first thing coming up, I think it's March 21st, maybe the thing Erica referred to before, it's Chapa's kind of affordable housing 101. It's a Zoom meeting, 6.30 to 8.00. I believe it's free. If it's not free, I think the town will reimburse you, but Erica is shaking her head that it's free. So uh, be it. that's a great possible thing to do. There is also Chapa's Fair Housing Symposium, which is on April 27th from one to four. And that's also a Zoom thing. Um, and additionally, MHP, the Mass Housing Partnership has a housing institute that has a Zoom day and a live day. That's in June. 14th is virtual and the 15th is in person in the Devons Common Center. Anyway, it's possible to go to those. It's possible for if you go for the town to help pay. All of those things seem like they would be great opportunities for us. Um, and there is our own next meeting on April 13th here in our same zoomy little place. <clears throat> Unless we are meeting in person because as we were talking about maybe before the meeting, um, there's something before the legislature right now about whether or not the COVID protocols for meetings will or will not be extended. They go through, I think, March. So. If they are not extended, we may be meeting in person next time. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. I don't know that there are items not anticipated. Uh, there are things that we will have next time, hopefully, on our agenda. We will have Margaret Randolph about tiny homes. We will, at some point, maybe do our own affordable housing development 101 thing. Uh, we will perhaps here, I'm wondering, maybe uh, either Nate or George can tell us if there is progress on our affordable housing inventory, which we'd love to hear from you about next time, another time. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> yeah, uh, I haven't talked to George much. We uh, shared the document. I will say the chair of the planning board undertook something really similar and listed um, 
a, a lot of developments in the last five years and then did bedroom counts and other things and someone else on staff have been doing it. And so I'm just uh, trying to pull the resources because I think I'd like to come up with I don't want to say like the you know a, a, a you know a unified document, but something where you know we're not no one, you know we're not doing redundancies, right? So I didn't realize that the chair of the planning board was me doing this. Something he did on his own. You know, George did something, and staff had started something, and so I'd like to um, look at those and then see who can you know I'd like to coordinate the effort. So it might just be that because I think some of the information that we wanted is all it's there. We just have to synthesize the documents, and so I'm trying to collect all that because um, I think what. George has started was great. And I, I think I'd like to make some additions. Like I said, you know, um, more, you know, granular detail. And then that becomes, uh, you know, a chart or table that can be shared and we can use. So uh, anyways, I, it's, it's, it, there's a bunch of pieces that was, are, that's already been done or is underway. And I just need to coordinate it. Yeah, I guess I would just like to request that. I'd like to have it be there even if all of the spaces aren't filled in, if we even know where are the where they are, where the buildings are, how many units are in them, and how many are affordable, that's a good start. I'd like to have that, and then if we fill in all the other things, bedrooms and prices and da da da, da as we go, but I would like to have at least that much as soon as we can. Well, I mean, I know you've got a lot of things to do, and I and yes, making it so that it's a coordinated effort and not each per not a hundred different departments trying to do their own thing is a really great idea i agree but if there's a way to get it you know get even that much of it solidified that i that would be great yeah i mean i'll look at, i thought what george had done there was a few missing things but it was mostly there so i think yeah it's just the rest of the the detail can we yeah can I ask? Um, so hold on. I'm. I actually would like to because Tim has his hand up again, and since he's been there the whole time and now wants to say something, I'd like to hear what he has to say. All right, Tim, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry, I was muted the first time as well, and I I was trying to talk at a very uh, inattentive laptop for a moment. Um, super grateful to be here. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of things really quickly. Um, so we, uh, a couple, yeah. So first and foremost, we hired our housing navigator, uh, which is an exciting addition to the Craig Stores team. Um, we've also been running data uh, that reflects within the first nine months of the new administration and our restructuring. We've doubled our housing placements um, for our guests. It looks like it's a product of deeper and broader case management. Um, we have also launched our fair access program. So all low, actually really anyone in the community can gain access to free uh, PBTA rides. Uh, day passes are being distributed at the um, survival center and we are distributing them to all of our guests on a daily basis and collecting the data. Um, and that's kind of shown us that uh, we don't necessarily have to stick to shelter and that there's there's capacity beyond. So we're really looking at um, potentially expanding our role in the housing space. Um, we're looking at permanent housing, uh, permanent supportive housing models and um, opportunities within town to do that. Uh, I did, kind of just wanted to to share with the group here in case anybody, we're, we have a lot to learn and um, we're learning rapidly, but any sort of guidance, support, uh, participation on our board, um, anything that you know, folks would be looking to contribute. We're looking to turn all of our operations into green operations to sort of improve that carbon footprint, which is something that we haven't looked at. Um, and yeah, I guess I just kind of wanted to throw that out into the ether. Any ways that we can be collaborating with the trust on a deeper level um, is really meaningful to us as we uh, kind of expand and diversify. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. And then Ashley, you had something you wanted to say? I was wondering, um, we don't have usually someone from town council um, attending. And I wonder if we could kind of encourage um, a town council person to attend every time because this basic Grover said it and I think we should go over what she said maybe another time like I'll watch it but um a suite of housing new bylaws and we need to like I think we need to deal with the town council quite a bit more 
with lots more engagement because part of it is that building is is one thing but changing the bylaws to get more affordable housing is like a, a bigger part i think we do have two liaisons between the town council and us i can't remember i believe that pat is one of them and maybe patricia pat romney is another one i think it's both jennifer of them have conflicts a what a Gen jennifer yes Trump. jennifer she has a conflict with the time paul bachelman practically always has a conflict with the time so at some point maybe we should think about changing our time although then we'll all have conflicts with the other time so <laughs> i'm not sure how to make it work but we do have liaisons and so we can ask them we can i mean if we have a question we want to ask them we can certainly i can or we can in one way or the other convey to them hey liaison we have this thing we would like to either know from you or have you know from us or we can communicate with them even though they're it would be it would be great i will at least communicate to them that we would like to have somebody at our meeting that's a good idea could we have a could we propose a shared meeting uh I don't know. I'm not. I think I'd, we'd want to figure out what in the world the focus of it was and what we. They have like a pazillion meetings already, so I'm not sure. I think that we would want to have a very clear understanding of what and what why we were doing it and what we were asking of them because they're they're already doing more than they can do. So it doesn't. It just doesn't sound like they know what we're doing, and I I don't know what they're doing. So it's like we're all such siloed people. And so it would be good if like we had communication, like do they know what affordable housing our goals are? Or, I mean, it, it, it's not clear. We can go, we can, uh, their meetings are always open. Any of us can attend them any time that we want. Um, so, but yes, we should communicate with them. Um, probably more than we do we can, can at least I will make sure to let them know that we would like their one of the liaisons to be with us um anything else anybody wants to say before we close then I would move or just just are we ready to adjourn is there any uh, uh, can we adjourn do we agree that we should adjourn i don't know how this comes across because you're not going to record well the picture gets recorded right so we're all all yeah. saying yes all thumbs up saying yes all thumbs up all <laughs> right thank you everyone it's great to be with you all again and i'll see you next week either live or like this have a good rest of your night you mean next month next month yes duh, duh. thank you <laughs> I am I'm ending it. <laughs>